I've had the great pleasure of talking with Dr. Vani Mahadevan to find out what attracted her into interventional practice, the barriers and the challenges she faced, and how we can encourage and empower other women into the profession. Dr. Vani, I'm so happy to see you here in person. Thank you so much for the time today. Chris, it's really great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real privilege and looking forward to our discussions. So let's get started. First of all, can you tell us a little bit more about your background and what you do? So uh, I'm an interventional cardiologist in the UK. Um, I qualified from medical school in 2008 and I've been practicing as, as a clinician for 15 years. I did uh, most of my cardiology training in the south coast of England um, and when I was signed off for training I then did two years of a post-CCT fellowship at the Bristol Heart Institute in complex intervention and uh, some research and finally took a consultant post uh, where I currently work at Portsmouth Hospitals University NHS Trust uh, on the south coast of England. And what attracted you to a career in interventional practice? For me, uh, the primary attraction to become a doctor was having lost a loved one quite early in life, uh, in my childhood, from heart disease. Um, so I knew very early on that actually I wanted to do, I wanted to be a doctor of the heart. Now initially I thought that would be a heart surgeon, because they were the ones that fixed, fixed patients with heart problems, but as I went through my teenage years and developed an interest in heart disease, I realised that cardiology was the, the predominant specialty that looked after heart patients. When I was about 15, 16 years, um, I applied to our local hospital. I wrote a letter and asked if I could go and watch uh, heart surgery and operations and shadow cardiologists uh, and heart surgeons. And I spent two weeks in the back of a cath lab and shadowing uh, registrars on the coronary care units and I was absolutely mesmerized by the beating heart and the coronary arteries. I realized then that there was a calling in interventional cardiology for me as an individual. We know from research that women are significantly underrepresented in interventional cardiology. Why do you think that is? I think if we look at it from a general perspective, interventional cardiology is a grueling specialty. It's actually a vocation and a way of life. You've got to be happy to wake up in the middle of the night and do an emergency procedure, and not everybody wants that lifestyle. It's a long training period. You're expected to undertake some academic research, to publish papers, um, to develop your interventional skills. Whilst some of your counterparts from medical school might finish their training in five years, you might still be going 15 years later. And again, that can put some people off. And then, of course, you're going to be working in the cath lab where you're going to be exposed to radiation, which has health risks, including that amongst those exposed to radiation, there are increased risks of malignancies. That's quite a topical subject at the moment. And you've got to wear leads and it can be quite physically demanding. So there's a risk of orthopedic injury. And I think those are generic to everybody, irrespective of your background or gender. I think there are some extra barriers that are inherent to individuals who have the non-interventional personality, as it were. And of course, if you have uh, different ethnic or cultural backgrounds or you come from abroad and you're trying to integrate as a foreign medical graduate or doctor into the UK system, for example, and those can all be challenging. And I think the final group uh, of hurdles is ones that perhaps we disproportionately face as women. Perceptions, for example, we're not traditionally seen as being individuals who would be good for a surgical specialty because often we would want to have families along the way. But actually I know some phenomenal women in interventional cardiology and other streams of cardiology who have done everything and done both and who have been very successful. Personality-wise, and again, these aren't inherent by gender, but generally, if you look at psychology and behavior, human behavior, women tend to be less confident even when they're equally competent. And this confidence competence mismatch sometimes can lead to us not putting ourselves forward for opportunities and being seen as not being capable. And that actually has been reflected in uh, research from Stanford about training environments. So if you look at surgical residents, female residents in the operating theatre in cardiothoracics are seen as being less 
autonomous or given less autonomy, even when they're equally competent. Leadership roles, again, there is a fine line between the double bind of aggression versus assertion, where you need to be assertive, but you can't be too aggressive. And then if we look at job opportunities, there's plenty of data that's been published by Harvard Business Review, McKinsey and Hewlett Packard, that if you're a female candidate applying for a job, you'll only really apply if you meet 80% or more of the job criteria. Whereas if you're a male, you're more likely to put yourself out there. And if you meet 50 to 60%, you'll apply. And when you're hiring from the other side, when you hire a female candidate, you're more likely to judge her capabilities based on what she's proven she can do, so performance, whilst if you hire a male candidate, you're more likely to hire them based on the potential you think they have. So there, again, there's a differential in how the judgments are made in terms of hiring. And I think all of these things together mean that sometimes we struggle slightly disproportionately compared to some of our male counterparts. And what helped you overcome some of the barriers you have faced? I think the first thing is perception. Not seeing the barrier as a barrier, but seeing it as a temporary challenge and a hurdle that needs to be overcome. Personal traits, I think it's really important to have an internal degree of self-confidence, self-belief. If you don't believe you can do something, you can't expect anyone else to believe that you're going to be able to do it. And I think you've also got to be able to fail without seeing failure as a problem. We all at points in our career have failures. And if you give up as soon as you have a single failure, you're never going to make it to your destination. And then I think support systems are really important. So I was incredibly lucky. Um, I've got a, a role model in my own mother who is incredibly supportive of my career. And then I grew up with a lot of... Uh, male family members, so I had four older cousin brothers and two younger brothers. I will go and seek advice from them and they've been unbelievably supportive. And then of course mentors, and I've been incredibly lucky in the, the sort of support systems that I've had with mentorship. And on that point, can you identify specific allies that have supported your growth and advocated to your development? I have five, and I can name them all one by one in the order in which I met them. They've all inspired me. Um, so I started off with Peter O'Kane when I did my first year of being a registrar in cardiology, Nick Curzon in my second year, Alex Hobson when I became a, a PCI trainee and started training in interventional cardiology, and then when I did my post-training or completion of training post-CCT fellowship at the Bristol Heart Institute, Tom Johnson and Julian Strange. These five people have been absolutely fundamental in my career in different ways. Some have taught me the importance of procedural excellence and developed my procedural skills to a level that I never thought I would be capable of. Some have taught me academic excellence. Some have championed outstanding patient care and taught me that mediocrity is not acceptable. Now, over the last few years, are there any other collaborations or networking outside your institution that helped you get to where you are today? Most units only have a single female interventional cardiologist and in a number of countries across the world you might have two or three units where there's no female interventionists or no ethnic minority interventionists. But what COVID has taught us, we, we can actually network virtually. So over the pandemic I often would network with other ladies in other units who were doing interventional fellowships and we would debrief about cases, support each other, encourage each other, also, virtually, I think when COVID hit, meetings all went to kind of webinars. We transformed the way that we learnt and we educated. And one of the things that came out of that for me was the CLIMB programme, which is run by Women as One. And the CLIMB programme looks at helping women who want to develop their skills in complex and CTO PCI. And I was lucky enough to do it last year with um, an excellent faculty. And the course directors were Anja Oxnes in Norway and Bill Lombardi in uh, the States, very much strongly supported by Margaret McEntergaard. And that allowed me access to some international mentorship, which I hadn't previously had. Um, and I also think that national societies, for example, BESIS, have done an awful lot to improve diversity and inclusion within their faculties, uh, within their committees. And lastly, I think industry partners have had a really strong role to play in terms of 
increasing the visibility of diverse groups uh, and improving diversity and inclusion across their collaborative projects and across interventional cardiology and obviously other specialties within cardiology. Now on this point about the industry's role, uh, how is Boston Scientific supporting your continued aspirations? Helping to improve visibility by putting women who you feel are credible on faculties, um, uh, ethnic minorities who you feel have value add on your panels and uh, within your meetings, I think has been incredibly helpful. And then of course, supporting individuals to upskill and things like rotablation, ADR, CTO techniques, and I think Boston have had you know, quite a strong role in helping to bring, bring in groups, including women, who perhaps didn't see themselves as individuals that could go on to do more complex interventions and giving them a platform to help them grow procedurally. So that's something certainly that I have and hope to continue to, to work with you guys on. What do you think the healthcare and medical sector as a whole should be doing to achieve a more equitable and have a more fairly represented industry? And how do you think this will make the difference for better patient outcomes? From the time I started cardiology training as a first year registrar to the time I took a consultant post about eight years later, roughly, almost all of the individuals who uh, perceived me as not being capable or not having the right sort of personality, or not seeing me as appropriate for certain job opportunities, or not treating me equitably, were Caucasian males. But in that exact ta same time period, 100% of the individuals that stood by my side and stoically supported, encouraged, motivated, trained, and opened the doors of opportunity for me were all Caucasian males. So I have a very balanced view on this because for me, this is not about gender. This is all about the mindset. It's about the difference between having an open mind that allows you to perceive an individual based on their merit and their capabilities rather than who they are or perhaps where they come from or their personality type versus having a more closed or traditional mindset where perhaps, and it's part of human behavior to, to think this way, but where perhaps you think that the sort of individual that would be appropriate to come into your specialty is an individual that's like yourself. And of course, we know that when we have diverse teams, from different backgrounds and cultures and gender and ethnic minorities, that those teams actually become more understanding, more tolerant and more collaborative. And of course, if we can emulate that across industry and healthcare professions, we will automatically level the playing field to retain and attract diverse and ethnic minority and females into interventional cardiology, but we will also then deliver much better patient care, which is the end goal for all of us. I couldn't agree more. It's all about the mindset. So what can you share to help encourage others into this career path? Well, of course, I'm very biased because I absolutely adore interventional cardiology. So for me, I don't think I could do anything else. I would say that Interventional cardiology is one of the most exciting, innovative and rewarding specialisms that you can do in cardiology and in medicine. Uh, it has the potential to positively make an impactful difference to patients and their loved ones every day and sometimes in the middle of the night. Um, and for me, the challenges uh, and the hurdles that I've faced uh, and the journey that I've taken has been worth every second of my time. Just remember that who you are and where you come from is not what dictates whether you can excel in interventional cardiology. What really matters is your purpose, your motivation, your work ethic and your determination and how capable you really are. So keep your mind focused on the end goal 
Uh, remember why you did it in the first place and surround yourself with a support system of individuals who will cheer you on and encourage you even in your darkest moments. And most of all, because life is short, enjoy the journey without worrying too much about the final destination. Vani, thank you so, so much for your incredibly valuable insights and shared experience. We wish you continued success and advancement in your career. It was such a privilege to have you here today with us.